an effort to come by, especially at 1 p.m. I know that you know it's really tough for you this this far into the con to start showing up to the talks. So I don't want you to be you know miserable. So yes, I'm going to try. Yeah. So so in my normal talks, I walk around, uh, stumbling around, and I'm doing some experimentation with my speaking technique. So for this talk, I'll be sitting down the entire time. So this is what I'm looking like. And we'll see if the... Oh, <laughs> Thank you! I, I, want, I want in my heart to think that you're saying that for... Congratulations on switching up your life and not just taking things for granted. But maybe it's just, oh, thank God damn, you're standing still. <laughs> so that works for me. Okay, so this talk is called Now and Then, Here and There. Um, editing. <laughs> so, let's begin. I hit a coyote. And let me explain how I did that. I was driving here uh, from Boston. Uh, there was enough stuff that I had to carry it in a car because a flight would be too much trouble. And at about 2 o'clock in the morning when I was starting to feel tired, a coyote ran across the road and proceeded to make a very interesting coyote decision, which was to make it completely safely across the road and me thinking our transaction was now complete and then having him decide he left something, perhaps his keys, on the other end of the road, and so he darted back, and I proceeded to hit him. Now, I was going 80 miles an hour, so I assume he's not feeling well, but I didn't have enough time to check as I head forward towards Cleveland, and I ultimately got here uh, something like 6 in the morning, so it's a 600-mile trip from Boston to Cleveland. And you always, you always remember every single mile, especially in Syracuse. Now, the, the, the concept with this story is that driving from Boston to Cleveland took me roughly 10 hours. And of that entire 10 hours, I just told you about one second of that trip, the clunk. And in doing so, I chose what to go after, and I took that one second and expanded it into a one minute to two minute discussion of that one second. And this is the fundamental aspect of editing. When people hear the word editing, they get several images in their mind, mostly somebody's fucking with my shit. Because when you create something and somebody else edits it, that means they're changing your original fundamental work into something else. For other people, it's your own self-modification. It's taking something that you did and changing it, having regarded it in the guise of yourself a few minutes, a few days, a few years later. Editing is often thought to be something involved with film. You take a series of shots of various actions and you turn them into something vaguely cohesive or something that tells a point, or something that is entertaining, if, even if not sensical. So it has different meaning to different people, but having now explicitly been an editor for the past five to ten years, I have come to the conclusion it's one of the most important aspects of living today. Because editing is, by its fundamental nature, the changing of something into something else, and we are currently living in a society where the generation of content has now actually moved from being merely overloading to being automatic, editing becomes, like breathing, a basic and vital biological process by which we continue to survive. But like breathing, you can do it wrong for a while, Vaguely self-correcting, but not always. But just as people only use a small capacity of their lungs when they automatically breathe unless they think about it, a lot of people edit in life, but they fall into certain uh, traps and other problems when they do it. So when I uh, put this together, I thought, you know, maybe I could at least pass along some of what I'm learning. Some of it's very, very obvious. But a lot of it is stuff that I think that people who consider themselves to be living in the modern age need to at least mull over or perhaps think about. So when, uh, when films started to become edited in the turn of the century, um, 
this novelty media, that is to say, a, a, a media where one delightfully enjoyed the fact that film worked at all, didn't need much editing at all. Uh, because they came on very large reels, and because the camera that they were running on was not very mobile, the shows, the films, tended to be fundamentally simplistic. So, uh, for instance, there would be a um, juggler who would stand up and juggle for a minute and then stop. Show is over. Completely unedited, except for the fact that they brought in a juggler and had him juggle at that time. But the actual performance was unedited. There was no need to. There was no second. It was just friggin' cool that there was just this thing working. Similarly, like now, if somebody shows you a new medium, we don't have it as, happen as much these days, but when somebody shows you a new technology, it's not overly important that what's being shown be absolutely stunning. Variations on it, things that have to portray themselves as an improvement over the thing that was there before, they have to get your attention because people say, well, I've seen something like this happen before. For instance, there was a new camera that came out last year called the RED camera, uh, which is going to revolutionize digital filmmaking as we know it. It's at red.com. It's a camera that at about $30,000, what used, what took, it took $300,000 to do a couple years earlier. So to show off their new camera and have people go, well, why do we even want to use this camera? They gave it to Peter Jackson for two weeks. And Peter Jackson got some biplanes because he literally had them lying around <laughs> and shot a small World War II era bunch of people hanging out, dog fighting and doing stuff just to say, here's the camera. Now, the reason that complicated set of work where they bring in somebody of that caliber to do that work is, is because the technology is incremental. When film starts out, when the World Wide Web starts out, when television starts out, it is merely interesting that the medium works to people. However, we are people who find things really boring really quickly, really fast. And we have been spending a large amount of time training ourselves to become even better at this as time goes on. I had a beautiful conversation with a woman who has the first doctorate in game theory. She, uh, in 1984, got a doctorate in the game adventure, a text adventure. She did this by observing players, dictating what they had done. Well, during our interview, and I should state, by the way, that she totally regrets this action and became a massage therapist a year or two after she finished her doctorate. <laughs> but she still occasionally, while apparently massaging people, thought of a couple facets of what she had spent her time on. And she said something to me that was so beautiful that I just thought, wow, this is really life-changing. And what it was was she said, you know, I think that the technology actually changes who people are such that the people who interact with older technology don't understand its draw or interest because they are no longer the same human beings that were the kind that experienced that object when it came out. This is an interesting concept, and like most interesting concepts, either sounds stupid to you or unbelievably insightful, maybe somewhere in the middle, but maybe one of those extremes. But I have really thought about this, and I thought, you know, she's really right. When World Wide Web hits, in 1993 to the general student public, you have a situation where previous actions, downloading a photo, grabbing somebody's work, going to another person's computer, have all become automatic point and click actions. You are suddenly faced with this torrent of information that isn't there before. So you as a person are just blown away by it. This is what caused Barksdale to decide, let's start Netscape. This is what started other people to just say, I'm going to become a web designer. I want to learn how to work in this archaic markup language so that I can make my things. It was the stunning experience of being in this torrent of information, which now would barely function as a pipette of knowledge in the modern era. When you can download a two or three megabyte YouTube video by mistake <laughs> while getting to something else and have a rickroll. <laughs> what you have originally is this experience of seeing things. But we as people know that you know, the first time we see the firework, that's amazing. The 50th time, it's not so amazing. After a while, we don't even have to see the firework to say we were there. We get very jaded very quickly. And because of the torrent of information that we now get through internet, and other technologies, we now have to find ourselves constantly cleaving off 
and deciding very quickly what has to go away. This is a core fundamental bit of editing. To get back to my dead coyote, right? Um, when he hit the tire, he crunched. But I chose not to put that into the beginning talk because I said, okay, for this particular audience in the beginning, they're wondering why I'm in the coyote anyway. Suddenly I'm going off about a head crunch. I got to go. I'm hungry. I'm leaving. Or maybe I'm less hungry. I'm leaving. So <laughs> these choices that I make as a storyteller are fundamental because perhaps you convinced yourself that the coyote lived. It was important to you that the coyote somehow, but they were okay in the end. And he took a hard hit, a little couple stars, and then he stumbled off into the field. Or maybe it was vital to you that he die, because that makes it interesting. It's not interesting until something dies. Did he kill him? Did the car jump? What did the car look like after it was done? Do you have photos? I'd love to see photos. Did you have audio running? <laughs> Could you hear him over the radio when he hit? What part of the experience of me hitting the coyote makes you say, OK, I want to learn even more about this? We have at our, uh, at our hands a wide variety of tools that are very good at recording information, bringing in information, and to some level sorting uh, information. And we do this all the time as people. So to go to film again, uh, film is a very interesting medium. Um, obviously, before film, we have books, uh, we have writing. We have oral tradition. And in oral tradition, obviously, there's, there are these now time-worn legends of, of shaman and, and spoken truth and everything else. But I'm going to stick with film. In the beginning of film, you have these basic, in, basically industrial demos being shown by Edison and others. Eventually, they're able to aim it outside at, say, a train, and they can shoot with the train and they can get other interesting subjects going on. They start bringing it to events, and they start showing it. Um, well, we start to see stories being portrayed. And the way that they do it, because they have no sound, is to show somebody gesticulating for about 10 seconds, <coughs> and then show you a placard with what that person is saying. So guy is sitting here going like this, and it goes, no, father, I do not wish to join you at the factory. And then it goes back to him again. A certain range of actor could live within this, with their faces made up heavily to handle the technology. We, as people in the modern era, find this unfathomable to watch. The concept of watching a major gesticulation and then a text paragraph explaining what they are saying is just unwatchable. You want to hit the fast-forward button. A wonderful invention. So, when we start to see the creation of films, as we start to think of them as narratives where there are multiple angles, what happens is, is that some of this is done out of necessity. That is to say, you have to, um, you have to get from here to there. What is the best way to show somebody getting into a car? Well, the worst way to show somebody getting into a car is to show them get up, walk through a room, go outside, get into the car, start it up, and leave. What you find is that for a lot of people, you can actually, now in the modern era, show a guy waking up in a bed and a car driving off. And our brains, our fantastic brains, will go, that guy is driving away. Because we're so good at that as human beings. It's one of our greatest skills. It's a tiger just went through that cave. I'm not going in that cave because there was a tiger there. Similarly, when I see a guy go behind this uh, placard and come out the other end, he walked behind that placard. I didn't see him, but he's back there. We constantly pull in shortcuts. It's why animation works. Show a variety of photos, and our brains just say, there's motion here. There have to be. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And so this skill, this skill at shortcutting everything, if a person is talking, if I'm talking now about the coyote, and a person leaves now to go to the bathroom, and they come back, their brain will work overtime to figure out what was said while, I was gone, while they were gone. Maybe I was gone, too. So this skill set is what editors end up dealing with. 
when you are showing something to somebody, if you've ever gotten this feeling, if you've ever gotten the feeling of, I need to show the guy this thing, but this beginning part is boring, but he has to see it. So we are both sitting here bored. I have seen this before, and he has seen enough that he wants to see. And I want him to see this one interesting portion. But I can't skip forward to it because they have to see the beginning part. It doesn't have as much push. That's the nature of editing. You as an editor are saying, well, what in my audience will they be able to sustain and deal with without being totally bored and leaving? When I first cut the BBS documentary, uh, the one that really strikes me, a good example of this, is uh, an episode called Make It Pay, which is about the bulletin board system industry. I thought this would be a funny thing to show a short film in the beginning. In the beginning, it's a guy basically selling you a BBS program. And it's very engaging and funny to see somebody in videotape saying, this BBS will do this for you and this thing for you. So I would show that, and then I would show you my credits, and then the movie would start. When I brought it in front of an audience, when I sat behind an audience, which is what I do when I figure out if something is good, and I listen to their breathing. Breathing is very important in presentation, and it's something you can't get when you're alone away from people. When you listen to the scope of their breathing and how their energy deflects, you can tell a lot about how this film or this presentation is affecting people. Someone sitting at the back of this room can sense from the head movement and from the actions. This is part of what we do as a certain grade of presenter. Some people, as you've, I'm sure, experienced, don't take any cues from anybody, but I do. So when I put this film in front of people, it was interminably long. My brilliant showing of this guy felt like a empty, broken can lying on the ground waiting for somebody to kick it. There was just no action. I went back and I put the guy there with the credits running over him. And the audience picked up immediately when I showed it again. Because now there's two separate tracks of information. What is this film about and what is this guy saying? And our brains are more satisfied. This sort of action wouldn't have been as popular 30 or 40 years ago because there was a different type of person watching them. One of the most interesting things to have happen in, these, uh, in the modern times is with the advent of YouTube, we are now seeing a lot of films that played in the 60s and the 50s where there were a lot of experimental cutting, things that made the movie unwatchable, a critical lack of success and a disaster, and we see it and go, that's pretty good. A good example of this, uh, Jim Henson, he of Muppets and Pneumonia, created this, aww, that's right. I won't, I won't put that in next time. <laughs> Uplift. Anyway, so he created a, uh, a show, a, tell, a show about a white room. If you watch this show, it feels like something that was made yesterday. It's about a man in a white room, and he doesn't know why he's in the white room, and over time, panels come out and people say things to him. Like, why are you in the room? How long are you here for? Hello, doctor. And his slow mental stability uh, deterioration as he slowly finds he can't leave the room. What is the room? What's the room about? Uh, in fact, I bet if you type Jim Henson room into YouTube, this comes up. Well, when this played, it just freaked people the hell out. It was played at like midnight, which is an even worse time to do it, because people at night regard things differently. Well, now we look at this film, we say, well, that really makes sense. Well, there's films that are being made now that are just indigestible to a modern audience. But over time, with uh, the addition, like our tolerance for discordant music has increased as, a, as, a, as a, just a race. Our ability to be shown two or three minor seconds of a shot and know that it is a person running has increased. You know, and there will actually be a generation gap. I mean, it's not to say that people who were born in 1950 or 1930 can't process it. They can learn to process it very quickly. But somebody who is born earlier, each of us, even us now, as we are born in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, we'll find that the 90s, so we find that uh, 
people are able to pro- the 20s, the people are able to process this information very quickly. Even though I'm jumping around in the statement that I'm saying, you're still keeping the main thread if there is one. Like he's saying this, but he just jumped off. The fact that I'm even able to do that is a testimony to, to, to what I'm talking about with editing. So when I shot my bulletin board system documentary, I shot 250 hours of footage. Now the problem with 250 hours of footage is it's very long. <laughs> That's the core incompetency in that. There's just way too long. If I say to somebody, I have the history of the BBS, it's 250 hours long. <laughs> one hundred and f- one, 205 people will now tell you the story of the BBS very slowly. Well, I had to make choices as an editor. I had to take 250 hours and turn it into whatever my final size was going to be, which was not going to be 250 hours. Now, obviously, I often ask the same question. To that level, I often ask questions. So cutting out the parts where I asked a question automatically cleaves something like 50 hours out. It takes me a certain amount of time to ask a question. That's something you don't have to see. If the answer isn't sufficient, then why do you need to hear the question? If a person asks you a question, why do you even need to hear uh, them say, why is this like this? If the person just goes, no, well then he's, he's not parlaying any information to you anyway, so you're not going to use that. So any of my questions automatically went away, so that cleaved away. Any time that people answered non-informatively, that went away. That took out a good piece of it. Any time we stopped it, any time I was talking to them on the camera about the meta issues about it. Uh, many times a person would not have memories, and I would go into what I call a story loop. I would proceed to tell them stories from the era that they are supposed to be experts in, at which point they would go, that reminds me of another story, and they would then tell me the story. Somebody who watches the raw footage, and I've had that happen, has said, why don't you ever shut up? <laughs> why don't you let them speak? Because you're telling them stories, and I'm telling them, well, because the person has forgotten their own history, uh, and they are being given a pop quiz on their own life. So to get them to feel comfortable, I'm asking them these questions. Well, I'm editing all this out. So a person looks brilliant. Uh, there are two people in my bulletin board system documentary who hate each other. This is a problem because they created something together. So people who would want to know the story would want to hear them talking together. But they both made it clear they wish not to be in the same room as each other. In fact, one of them was so reticent he wasn't interested in being interviewed at all and it took a team of 10 people three years to convince him that he should do it. So I interviewed one guy for six hours. I interviewed the other guy for an hour uh, at his home a couple years later. But I edited them together. They actually complete each other's sentences. When people see them, they say, oh, these old friends are telling you what it was like back then. But in point, these now tired enemies are now recounting these boring stories that I have cut to the chase for. The question that comes into mind immediately is ethics. Is this ethical? Is this an ethical act that I am doing? Because a person might then immediately invite them both to dinner <laughs> and wonder why one's begging off for no good reason, and feel kind of slighted. Well, the question becomes, well, what's the purpose of what I was trying to do? Well, the answer is, I wanted these two people to discuss something they had done 25 years earlier. And the fact is, is that people get older and change. So asking them to discuss things becomes a history lesson. And so the fact that a historian or a person is not who they were doesn't negate what they did, so I took a hard look at it and said, I can do this. I'm going to put together these things they say. Because at no point do they indicate things that are lies. At no point do they call each other things that they shouldn't. They markedly did not. And so by taking the parts that happened to coincide, they were uh, basically telling me a story. It just happened to be three years apart, 400 miles apart, and cut into different hours. As people, we just accept that. We just accept that footage coming in. We don't freak out. We don't say, what, wait, wait, wait where, where, where are we now? You don't hear that in the middle of the movie theater, unless the movie really blows. <laughs> um, but people will just accept anything. They'll just say, okay, why is this going on? There's a movie out called Get Carter. It's a remake of a uh, earlier film called Get Carter. And it stars Sylvester Stallone and Michael Caine, as opposed to the original that starred Michael Caine. Anyway, so 
I was really impressed with the editing of this film. I thought it had some really forward thinking editing. And I want to describe a sequence in it. Um, Carter kills somebody. This is what he does. He's very angry at this guy. He did a very bad thing to a relative of his. And he wants the band to die. Well, the way that it's portrayed in the movie is that he walks up to the guy in his room and you hear the guy pleading for his life. In the background is the sound of a car alarm. So you see the man pleading for his life, and the next shot, the car alarm is still playing, but now Carter is walking outside, and he walks by the body of the man who was just pleading for his life that has landed on a car, and people are gathering about it as he leaves. This short 10-second sequence portrays what could have been a three- or four-minute flick from Pulp Fiction, killing somebody, whereas in Pulp Fiction, a person being killed becomes a humorous back-and-forth dialogue. This was to simply portray that he had killed somebody and to portray it as short as possible. So they actually combined the sound of two different shots into one. Now, this is not something you would see earlier in film, but they can do this now because films are cut so quickly. Uh, A lot of people blame MTV for this. That's very simple to do. But MTV is just simply the vanguard of digital editing and nonlinear editing and advances in technology. Um, MTV discovered very quickly that they were a money-making powerhouse. Films of, of people singing songs had been around for many years. There are some beautiful 1930s films, 40s films of just, here's this famous person and he's playing some music and isn't that awesome. Uh, obviously many films have just music playing in the background and are in fact music videos. You have these promotional films made by uh, places like, um, or I should say, groups like ABBA. Rod Stewart had over 200, which were basically, here's a song and here's him performing it. But MTV provided a quick uh, uh, stage for this to happen. And so what they discovered by mistake was this whole idea that suddenly bands that looked good were as popular as bands that sounded good because this new medium had struck up. And so just the fact that somebody was able to be engaging visually at the same time they were doing their music on the television produced groups like Duran Duran, which was essentially a home project of a... In, uh, a what do they call them? A, he's, he, was, he was a millionaire, an inheritance, a... Oh, well, anyway. No, yeah, an heir. He was basically an heir who had earned a lot of money. So when you see the, film, when you see the, um, the music video Rio, her name is Rio, and she dances on the sand, and she rides on this, bite, on this boat that is riding, that is Simon Le Bon's parents' boat. <laughs> when they did their shot, they said, what can we do to make this engaging? Let's use the family boat. What an engaging shot. Let's do a bunch of shots on the boat. And this visual move changes the nature of that song. Suddenly the song is one about women and this boat and, and this beautiful shots all being done. And it was merely luck that Duran Duran was at that juncture because of that approach. Now, to get back to uh, narrative structure, with my film... I had to tell a story. Now the problem is reality doesn't have a story often, or it doesn't have one story. We all have minuscule stories in our lives, and they're interesting, but they're not always meaningful. Your second relationship is not necessarily a clever insight on your first. It might in fact feel exactly like your first, or your fifth might be the one. But you can convince yourself if you watch a film and watch a person go through the maneuvers of relationship that this has meaning and something's going to happen here. So you have him take the gift of one and give it to the other and then it focuses on that. Well, the, 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 the choice of the, the, the camera to focus on a gift that you've given somebody who you had gotten from somebody else imbues that shot with meaning because there's this sense in visual uh, productions that what you see in itself has to have some level of meaning. Uh, a classic film noir example is to have everything be about this, this, this gift that was supposed to be given to a girl, but she stood you up. And so the gift lies meaningfully by the rain. Why does the rain have meaning there? 
The rain has meaning because the rain sounds great and looks great. And it brings you into a mood of a storm. All of this meaning that's imbued into this visual shot. An editor says, this is happening all the time. When you have an interview with somebody, and that guy constantly picks his nose, it is no longer about what he is saying. It is about the fact that he is picking his nose to a certain segment of your audience. You have two choices there. You might think it's so important that we see him that the nose picking is actually ancillary to the problem, which is a lie. Or you can do clever cuts away when he picks his nose. Um, I call it editing for brilliance. Um, you take what somebody has said. Now, there have been cases where I have taken somebody. A good example was I took a stutterer, and I removed his stuttering. Now, is that a problem? Well, in this particular case, he says a particularly brilliant thing. He says, you know, you take a million kids, give them hacking materials. Well, most of them will be idiots, 999,000. Out of that thousand, meh, after six months, they'll drop it. Out of, you know, maybe there'll be 100 after that. Out of those 100, maybe 10 will be interesting. But you know what? Let history decide that. Don't decide what kids can do. It's a very interesting statement. It took him seven minutes to say it. But I ended up cutting out all of his stuttering. Now, I have removed the information that he stutters in replacement for the thing he's trying to say. This is critical because when you start to do things like do blog posts or when you write about something that's happened, you are along the way always editing. You choose what to put in into your story. So when you see a story, uh, right now we have a huge mimetic influenza occurring because Rick Rowling has hit the mainstream. This means that now everybody, you know, and it's interesting to watch the homogenous herd get hit by this, <laughs> but everybody who uses a computer and browses the internet may hear Rick Astley sing this year. Between the news stories, between YouTube, Rick rolling two million people on April 1st. You may have everybody know who Rick Astley is. You may have them all experience it. They may not even know the context. Some of them may not have heard of him in the 80s. Some of them will not have been born when his song came out. And this song and this video that was shot in the way it was <clears throat> um, is now this central core of our culture for some period of time. You can reference Rick Rolling, and most people will know what you're talking about. This is a stunning change in how we are pulling in our information. Well, we, when we pass along, when we choose to Rick Roll somebody, right, we are choosing to take this nugget of information and give it to someone. Why are we doing it? Well, we're doing it for various reasons. One, it's funny to some people. It's, it's weird to see this man singing. It's an odd video because in the 1980s, it was edited to sell a product. Rick Astley, who has the additional weird thing of he doesn't, he doesn't look like his voice. He's this very skinny, redhead guy singing with this, you're never going to give you up, right? Beautiful, low voice. It was weird back then. It's strange now. <clears throat> why did this happen? Just like we wonder, why the hell did William Shatner record music albums? <laughs> well, a part of that was simply because part of the standard promotional cloud of an actor or performer back in the 50s and 60s was to have them have a doll, to have them have a game, to have them have music, a music album, and to have them do appearances on television. And quiz shows. Quiz shows and talk shows were considered about the same thing back then. So your appearance was important. So let's put him in front of a microphone and make him do music because that's one of the standard things we do. Well, now it's totally lost that kind of context. So we just see, why is William Shatner singing this so poorly? <laughs> the answer is because he's kind of left on his own. Why did Spock do one? Well, why did Rick Astley do this strange video in which he's dancing and you're a bartender? What is the meaning of the bartender? What is the meaning of the woman who can't actually follow her steps? 
And it turns out that she just she didn't know her steps. Why do we know this? Because people have researched the frigging Rickroll. Because it's come in front of enough eyeballs that we watch it. What time is it? I have to edit myself. What time? 141. So, um, it's important to keep track of your own time. Because otherwise, it can go on. I can go on for hours about this. And that would be unhealthy. Anyway, so... To go through some things that I learned when editing, you can always find footage to cut. In a world where we can save footage to a great extent, we can save the things we write to a great extent. Uh, when I speak of film, a lot of it applies to writing, to image creation. You know, with the creation of copy and paste, everything changes. That whole paradigm of, of, of interacting with your creations changes when you can say copy and paste over here. It's a whole different way of looking at things. When you can edit photos, you can manipulate them. They're not frozen moments stuck in time that you have captured once and have to move on from, pull what you can from. Even though it's a blurry photo of somebody, you say to yourself, well, yeah, but I love them. That's all I need to know when I look at that photo. Something, a meaning that might not have any meaning to anyone else, but that's what it means to you. Well, now eh, you can fix your eyes a bit. Make it look like you wanted to put something in front of it. Put a cap behind it. You can change how it looks because it's no longer this set in stone, malleable thing. Well, as we are progressing in technology, we are getting better and better at that. Editing tools are now actually becoming free. They're running out of ways to monetize it. So at this point, the only way they can monetize it is to do things like make a certain level of Photoshop free. Flickr has a free editing tool. Um, Sony has taken a $500 editing program that I use called Vegas and created a $99 version that's good for people. Virtual Dub is free and will let you edit to some extent most of what you would need. Now, where do I read, what do I read in that trend? What I read is that they're running out of people to sell editing to. So they have to make more editors. And the only way to make more editors is to give them free crack and go, here's some thing you can use to manipulate the world. This is an old, old, old business plan. And yes, it works awesome with drugs, but it also works awesome with software. It works awesome with food. This is why when you walk through a wholesale club, somebody shoves a horribly made clam thing in your hand and says, try this clam thing, because it is worth it to us to give away this many clam things if we can cause one more addicted clam thing eater. <laughs> so similarly, there is a huge benefit to just teaching everyone to be editors. But all that is to people is this process of putting multiple things together. And I can tell you that uh, editing as a skill set uh, is one where you start to notice this secondary meaning. There's an old, old adage saying that if there's a gun on the wall in the first act, you have to fire it by the third. That's simple stuff. That's the stuff that's passed around because it sounds kind of neat. A more accurate way to portray it is people do not passively watch things. When they watch things, they wonder things. Is she going to get naked? Are they going to fight? Where are we going to end up? Is somebody going to find them? Why does he look so cute to me? They are constantly running an internal dialogue when they are watching things. This is what we do as people. One of the most classic ones, the question you really don't want people to ask is, why the hell am I here? <laughs> why am I stuck here doing this? Why am I not somewhere else? And in a world where it's much easier to shut things off, there's a beautiful little clip from um, David Lynch, um, which has been making the rounds. Um, it's from another interview where he is simply riffing and he's in front of a microphone, a meaningless gesture meant to give you an impression that he's doing something of weight, that there's this beautiful microphone in front of him. But at one point he launched into a little rant about watching films on phones, very angry, where he said basically, you know, you are cheating yourself if you think you are watching a movie on a phone. You know, just, you're fucking kidding me. And this got spread around on phones as a way of, <laughs> and in fact, people started to record phones showing it and then show films of the film of the phone showing it. <laughs> on one level, they are correct. They are showing that the human mind 
can interpret anything. We are so good at just being shoved. Just, we are the Mr. Fusion. You can just shove whatever garbage into us, and we will absorb it. But on the other hand, you will not come away feeling like you didn't just absorb garbage. That's the missing other part. People will withstand anything, but they will not forget that they were forced to withstand it. This is what you as an editor are trying to fight. So um, sometimes it's time. I have discovered that people get bored after about 20 seconds of seeing the same thing. It sounds sad and pathetic or weird, but it's true. After about 20 seconds, we wonder why we're still looking at this shot. Unless something blisteringly compelling is keeping us there. I described um, a product or an event as being like a um, Cadillac convertible leaning over the side of a parking garage over a public pool. That it, it was obviously going to lead to some horrifying disaster, but yet it was strangely compelling and, and, and caused you to be rather introspective of what may happen next. And that's the fact, is that as long as people are kept in a sense of tension, they will absorb things. So that's why you say, uh, I can't believe someone is going to die tonight. That will let people run an internal monologue on wondering who's going to die while they're watching what is otherwise a relatively mundane play. Well, similarly, when you edit, there are ways to make people feel more compelled about what you're watching. What are some of those ways, you say, Jason? Well, one way is to, like I said, provide tension, to have something going on in the background. You'd be surprised how, if you're doing a, um, a stand-up, if you're saying something to somebody, and you want to tell people something, having a background that moves automatically floods your uh, information with all of this ancillary knowledge, like, what does a place around you look like? What's going on there? And if it's not too distracting, it actually easily makes it 10 times more compelling. We as people want to have multiple streams. It's funny that you as a person will often watch something and be like, boring, but you'll turn around and do something single thread in a world that has been training itself endlessly to be multi-thread. You know, we are just training ourselves to be multi-threaded beings now. Some of you are on laptops, you bastards. <laughs> and the fact is, is that you have to be. The simple aspect of a person talking is no longer a compelling enough idea, especially because there's nothing behind me to distract you, like a PowerPoint. You just don't have any other stream of information. It's either me and how I look and how I'm presenting myself, or you're doing something else. You have to have that multi-threading. And if you, as a person who's creating objects, don't keep that in mind. Another thing is that in a world where storage is cheap, it is also easy to fall into the trap of uh, presentation is cheap. Well, if there's all this stuff here, why not just put it all up? And the answer is yes, but it really helps to have what you consider to be the primary portrayal of what you're trying to get across, a weblog entry, and then say, I referenced these 300 pages to tell you this two-paragraph thing. Here they are. A lot of people do that. A lot of people don't. Um, when you do a film, it is very easy to fall in love with your creation, to say, look at how wonderful that looks. But the fact is, is that it portrays nothing to the audience. Um, I had the pleasure, and I encourage this because it's illegal, um, of watching the Phantom Edit. The Phantom Edit was a version of Star Wars The Phantom Menace that somebody edited to make it good. <laughs> now, he made multiple choices in editing. Uh, he cut down but did not remove Jar Jar. He found scenes where people said things to each other. And um, uh, everyone knows it. In other words, like, we're going to go get the ship. And then they would meet other people and go, we're going to go get the ship. Well, the audience no longer needs to know that. Well, the editor eventually was outed, and he produced a DVD, which is on torrents, of him commenting on why he made these choices. And he cut out something like 20 minutes of the film, 20 minutes that he thought didn't have to be there. And he mentioned how now he can't watch the original. 
because it's so long and it makes all these choices. But his, that is a free film school. Um, there was one other clip which I will encourage you to look at. Um, it's called Robert Rodriguez 10 Minute Film School. It's a YouTube video. He shows you how he was working on his film called The Mariachi. Robert Rodriguez is a very smart man because he uses whatever resources are available to him. His actors are his teamsters. He convinced the local police to lend him guns. He used whatever vehicles they had. He would shoot a scene and constantly zoom in and out as he was doing it. So when he cut it together later, it looked like there were multiple camera angles. <laughs> he shot 80 minutes of footage for a 75 minute film. So you, when you watch him talk about what he was doing there, now the only downside to this of course was he really abused his people. Part of why movies cost so much and why we have unions is so you can't make your people work for 24 hours and you can't make people have nine hats and make them do all sorts of unhealthy things like strapping squibs to them so they'll explode on your actor. There's actually a shot he has of them testing it where they're trying to figure out which one's the big one and which one's the small one because they were different color codes and they set one off and you hear someone go, ow, and they go, that's the big one. <laughs> anyway, but his editing technique, now when he moved, he became known as this unbelievably economic filmmaker. Well, as soon as he got digital cameras, he stopped turning them off. He actually would record everything. They would almost be like closed circuit television. He would just run them and just be there with the actors and run through different takes. And the actors were like, when do you yell cut? He was like, never. <laughs> because digital filming is cheap. It doesn't cost me anything. And if we capture something while I'm zooming around trying to get something, then we do it. So he's using a resource that's available to him. So it's very interesting to watch how he turned very cheap production into what we expect to be editing. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. You know, there's a hundred stories I could tell you about the, the nature of editing, but it's more important to me that you understand how important editing is and recognizing that editing really is the process of distilling life to where it is informative. Because we really care about information now. And editing makes the mundane interesting. And it makes the unclear clear if it's done right. Um, so, I mean, the real story, of course, is that everyone here is an editor. They're born <laughs> editors, they die editors. They go through a period of life where everything that's come in is correlated, processed, and brought out again. As soon as you realize that's your fundamental core, your fundamental core competency, I look forward to the movies that you'll tell yourself in the future. All right. Do we have any? Uh, that, that, that's the end. <laughs> All right. How much time do we have left, Ted? Uh, we're, you're over time. We're, we should break right now. We're done. You can have like one question. I can have one question. <laughs> no, don't make it good. Make it suck. Then everyone feels good that they didn't stand up too. Yes, I see. Um, I just wanted to think, you know, remember when uh, in the 90s they started talking about interactive television, interactive media? Yes. I, I mean, I think they were talking about it way too early, but I think it really has materialized. That is the blog. I think the blog has become interactive television. The blog is a single thread discussion board about a guy, <laughs> moderated by the guy. <laughs> Well, well, but Metafilter is not a blog. It calls itself a blog, but it's not. It's a very well-run message theme. I mean, I agree that it's very easy to get hung up with history to go, who did what first? It's very easy to do that. In other words, you go, well, yeah, you've come out with this nice new thing, but in fact, versions of it exist for 50 years before. If you ignore that, and instead focus on what new things they've brought to the table and how good it is, then you can say to yourself, wow, this is, this is really neat. So when I hear things like interactive, which got bumped around a bit, and instead just say, well, a meta filter, right? Because we're, so, we're so gifted now 
I had a friend I just spoke to recently who said, you know, like, oh, you know, I would love, I wish somebody would just put up all the Chilly Willy cartoons because there's this one where he goes more and more when he's being given some, some, um, some fish. And I wrote um, Chilly Willy Fish into YouTube and I sent him a URL yeah. of just Chilly Willy going more and more. He was... The time from, I wish I could see that, to he saw it was 45 seconds. <laughs> and, you know, people walk away from some of the treasures that they're given in time, right? The fact that every time you drink some of the water, it's clean. Well, that's an example of how happy we are, how gifted we are with our ability to take ideas and have them portrayed for us in milliseconds. And, and, and so when I see things like... Um, Interactive being, you know, like interactive television, the idea, you know, I mean, a lot of interactive television and its approach. Um, I look more on the fact of, like, just what are the good parts of blogs? And what are the interesting parts of blogs? The immediacy, the, the, the person, the stuff, instead of saying, has the dream finally come true? Because to me, there's more dreams coming true. I'm answering your question very poorly. Yeah, well, it wasn't a question either, but I Even, my point is that I really do think that that is a success. That is Storytelling to theater, to film, to, to blogging, to following someone else's thread and making your own edits. And right. That. It won't be called blogging because I think we've almost yeah. beaten that into the ground. <laughs> um, I'll be walking around and able to answer questions. I'm sorry, we have to let the fat man on because it all gets better with the fat man. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. I'll be around. Please play a part in Block Party if you can. Enjoy what's going on. Enjoy Nauticon.